Let's dive in. How can I defend confidently when I have uncertainty, and how do I fight doubt? Do you all have confidence <laughs> in answering this question? I, I'm trying to find it because I think we need to look at the, at the Great Commission. And then I need my glasses. Thank you, Dr. Godfrey. <laughs> now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw Him, they worshipped Him. But some doubted. These were the disciples, and some doubted. And what Jesus did was gave them the Great Commission. So I think we should pause over that expression uh, that some doubted, and, and that might give us recognize that we have sympathetic folks here. Uh, uh, you know, there are many levels on which to answer this question, and there are many different kinds of, of doubt. Uh, I've just finished a series on Ecclesiastes. Um, I'd never preached on it before. I've done Bible studies on it many times, mainly because I wasn't sure which opinion about Ecclesiastes I should adopt. But I decided this year that since I'm 65, I'm going to die shortly, and I've never preached on Ecclesiastes, so I, I just need to dive in. And it, it was staggering to me, because I know this book, I've read it many times, but, but it was staggering to me how honest um, Solomon is about doubt, about this world does not make sense, this world under the sun um, can be unfair. Um, life can throw curveballs at you. Actually, God can throw curveballs at you. Uh, you can be hit in the side of the face, and, and you're completely stunned. Um, but it was the honesty of that, that that actually was its redemption, that we do live in a world uh, where we don't have all of the answers. Um, there are huge moral uh, injustices uh, in this world, and not just in the world of unbelief, but it's in the church. It's in it's in Christian. It's in our lives. It's in the lives of those whom we love. Uh, you know, a young couple who get married and they're expecting their first baby, and then this baby has multiple issues, and all of a sudden their life is going to be different from here on in, and it's not the dream marriage that they thought it was going to be, and, and um, the marriage that ends up in divorce, and, and w w what happened here? Where did this all go wrong? Uh, who's to blame? And, and those, are, those are honest doubts, I think, that the book of Ecclesiastes seems to face head on. And I think one of the things that came that I came away with at the end of the series of Ecclesiastes was what, what a gift this was uh, and is from the Lord, um, that we don't, have to, we don't have to pretend with our sense of injustice, with our questions of, of why and why me and why now and why so harsh. Um, the gospel can cope with all of these things. And, and so I think that dealing with doubt is, is being honest, and, and I think God wants us to be honest. You can throw all the arguments you want, and the gospel will stand up at the end of the day. Uh, I, I was thinking… Um, Derek has approached this very helpfully from a sort of big question of, of issues that surround us, but I, as I heard him, I was also thinking that one of the biographers of John Calvin said that John Calvin was a singularly anxious man. Now, it wasn't a very good biographer, but he may have been on to something that uh, Calvin does seem to have had as a recurring theme of his theology, how can I be certain? I want to be certain. I need to be certain. Certainty is crucial. Um, uh, Calvin defined faith in terms of certainty. 
faith is certain, Calvin said. Well, but Calvin was also aware that people had plenty of doubts. And one of the dangers of doubt is you can begin to wonder, do you really have faith at all? And what Calvin, I think, very helpfully said is that for the Christian, doubt comes from the outside to attack faith. And therefore, the antidote to doubt is faith. And the antidote to doubt is all the things that build up faith, uh, reading the Word, hearing the Word preached, um, the fellowship of God's people, the encouragement that we receive in praising God together, so that as faith is built up, that anxiety of doubt is reduced or, or fought. And um, so I, I think that is helpful to focus on faith as an antidote to doubt, not allowing doubt to sort of redefine faith or undermine faith, but to answer doubt with faith. It, it's also interesting that in the 17th century that the, in the Westminster Confession, I know you, you subscribe the other confession, but in the Westminster Confession… Earlier, better, but go ahead. The, 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 probably the best worded chapter in the entire confession is, is the chapter on assurance, and it, it demonstrates the degree to which the Puritans struggled with the issue of doubt, that faith itself is certain, but the experience of faith can often be something else. And, and there was no attempt made on the part of the Calvinists of the 17th century to avoid that conundrum, but actually address it head on. Dr. Lawson, what, is, what does it mean biblically uh, to be called? To be called, what does that mean biblically? Well, uh, there's different calls in the Scripture. Um, there's the call to faith in Jesus Christ, which is the effectual call, and that call uh, is irresistible. Uh, it is the summons of the Holy Spirit to lay hold of the elect sinner and draw them and bring them into saving union with Christ. So there's the call to salvation. Um, there is the call to service, and there's the call within that to preach. And so, I mean, I could articulate the different subheadings under that. Um, so, to be called, it would depend on which call you're referring to. There's also a third call, which is just simply the external call, which is the witness that is given through the preacher, through the parent, whatever, um, that invites lost sinners to come to Christ. So, the free offer of the gospel is a call to come to Christ. Um, as I said earlier, that can only go to the ear. It cannot go to the heart. Uh, the Holy Spirit must take it from the ear to the heart, and that is the effectual call. And, of course, that's mentioned all through the Bible. Um, and then there is the call to service. Um, so, those would be the three, and the question you asked is, what, what is the biblical meaning of to, to be called? Um, obviously, the one who is called is passive. The one who is issuing the call is active, and that call um, for salvation and service must come from God Himself. There's not an audible voice that we hear. Um, as it relates to coming to faith in Christ, it is the Word of God that is brought home to the heart by the Holy Spirit that apprehends and lays hold of the sinner. In reality, it's a, it's a subpoena that comes from heaven that overcomes the resistance uh, of the sinner's heart. And then the call to service, I mean, there's so much to be said about that as well, but it is God singling out within those who have been called to Christ to a certain vocational um, calling. Uh, some of those would be preachers, but there's also vocational calling as well to uh, an area of service as unto the Lord. So, I don't know if I totally understand the question completely, um, but it's a great answer. Could, could, could we find a question to spark that answer? <laughs> C. 
See what I have to work with up here? <laughs> Dr. Godfrey. How should understanding the history of the world, both biblical and secular, shape our reaction to modern events and future events? That, that's a great question, and I, I'm sure Steve would have a great answer. Uh, You're correct. <laughs> so I'll give my B answer, and then he can give the A answer. Um, I, I, I think what a study of history does, both biblical history and secular history, is uh, really help us see that we're not quite as unique as we'd like to believe we are. Uh, our age, uh, I was just talking to some folks at the break, uh, as Americans, we want to either live in the best time ever or the worst time ever. We have to be superlative. We can't be content with being just at a kind of crummy time. And um, uh, so by studying history, we can see that uh, on the political stream, uh, there have been really great presidents and really awful presidents, and however you rank the current one, the republic is likely to survive. It's not guaranteed, but it's likely to survive. Um, politics has been a nasty business in America through most of the history of the republic. If you know that, you're not quite so discouraged. Um, you know, it, what's really dangerous to read about the modern world is to read ministers. Uh, because ministers in every generation think they believe in the worst, they live in the worst time ever. Uh, and ministers are forever complaining. And of course, that's their calling um, <laughs> to, uh, to confront any age with its failures and to call them to a better way. Uh, but in the process, they may leave the impression that we're in the worst place ever. And we're in a bad place, I think, but it's nowhere near the worst place ever. And we need to pray earnestly. It won't get any worse. So uh, I think, um, you know, this is Calvinist comfort at its heart. Cheer up. Things could be worse. <laughs> and uh, um, history will do that for you. How does personality come into play with apologetics? How can introverts be good witnesses for Christ? By the power of the Holy Spirit. And you read the book of Acts, when you look up every time someone is filled with the Holy Spirit, either at the end of the verse or in the following verses, it says they opened their mouth and spoke with boldness. The word boldness means all speech. Uh, that you tell it all, that you hold nothing back. If you do a personality study of the 12 disciples, you see very different personalities, extroverts, Peter speaking out before the others speak, others more reserved. But when they are filled with the Holy Spirit, which is much like being filled with wine, uh, they are liberated to speak the truth with great certainty and with great confidence. And so, yes, there are different personality types, but the Holy Spirit is greater, and He gives um, a great assurance as we give our testimony, and we speak up as we're filled with the Holy Spirit. So, I, I think that's at the heart of, of the answer, and of course, some people are more um, reserved and introverted, other people more expressive and naturally speaking, I mean, for example, Calvin was very much an introvert, Luther was an extrovert, yet nevertheless they were both as bold as a lion and, and blew the trumpet that needed to be sounded. Um, so I think the key, the key really lies with God in the man. But I, I think, speaking for introverts, you may be surprised, but I am. Um, I, I think it's important to realize that, that boldness is not a personality attribute, mm -hmm. uh, and that introverts in a quiet way can be just what someone needs at the right moment. And so those of you who are shy and retiring like me, um, you can 
uh, be sure that the Lord can bless the witness you bear as well, and that, that sometimes a softer, gentler word is just what's needed by someone um, uh, when it's brought by the Holy Spirit. Well, and someone who's an extrovert can also bring a soft word. So it… it <laughs> <laughs> So, no, seriously, and <laughs> so I, I, I don't think we say extroverts always give loud witness, introverts give gentle witness. I, I don't think it works that way, and I agree with you that boldness is not a personality thing. It's, it's a fruit of the Spirit in reality. It's produced by the Holy Spirit in the man. What are the different approaches to apologetics, and which one do you prefer? So, this could obviously be a seminary-level course. So, in a matter of 30 seconds for each of you, how, how would you answer this? Different approaches to apologetics, and which one do you prefer? So, in the 20th century, we saw basically three schools emerge. There was the evidentialist approach. I guess the best exemplar of that would be Josh McDowell of marshalling a lot of evidences, his book, Evidence That Demands a Verdict. Uh, there was also the presuppositional school, and the exemplar of that would be Cornelius Van Til and sometimes associated with Westminster Seminary and Van Til of uh, presuppositionalism. And then there was the third approach that was called classical because it was seen not only as using the classical arguments but also of, of a history, but articulated as the classical. And in many ways, Dr. Stroll was a key figure in articulating that as a particular approach to apologetics with the book he co-authored with Arthur Lindsley and with John Gershner, Classical Apologetics. So, as the 20th century, uh, we could see that taxonomy of those three approaches. And of course, I'm a classical apologist. I'm whatever RC is. <laughs> that was the mic drop right there. He Bob got Godfrey it in just the water. got baptized. <laughs> Let he me say me before it. Bob does. Wouldn't, wouldn't you know the Baptists would drop it in the water? Yeah. <laughs> there, you're in. He's been converted to sprinkling. <laughs> That's all you need. Just a little dip will do you. <laughs> Meanwhile, back at the ranch. Uh, let's get back to the question. Um, you know, I'm at a, I'm at a Ligonier conference, so obviously um, I have enormous respect for uh, classical apologetics as, as R.C. did it. And, and he did that uh, probably better than anyone that I've ever heard. And when you listen to RC, uh, you think that's the way to do it. Um, you know, what, what are, are there clear lines of distinction between um, Dr. Spruill's classical apologetics and Van Tillian? presuppositionalism, and I think it depends on who the presuppositionalist is, uh, that, that, that that difference can be exaggerated, and it, it wasn't just a point, but it was actually a spectrum. Um, so since I'm at Ligonier, I'm with RC. As an introvert, I'm uh, taking the fifth. Um, well, I've, I have taught at uh, Westminster Seminary all my life and been surrounded by Van Tillians and been very um, impressed by the work of Cornelius Van Til. Um, but I have also been impressed over the years as I've heard, spoken with R.C. and heard his critique of Van Til and heard Van Tillian's critique R.C that there is a measure of talking past one another on some of the issues. And um, what Dr. Ventil was particularly concerned about 
was that we not a tru approach truth as something neutral and uncertain. Uh, Dr. Ventil believed that as a Christian we ought to be certain, sort of brings us back to the beginning, and that we enter into a conversation not to try to find truth but because we know the truth. And, um, but talking to R.C., I, I find th that there's a great conviction about that on his part too. The Vantillians would say, well, the classical apologists, apologists assume a kind of neutrality and think they can argue people into the kingdom of God. That's clearly when our, not R.C. taught. So there is a measure of talking past each other. I think it is very helpful in thinking about people and communicating to people to realize they come at any discussion with pre presuppositions. They come with certain attitudes deep in their own heart, and we come as Christians with presuppositions as well about the truthfulness of our faith. So I, I don't know that we have to be set against one another. And uh, Cornelius Van Til, for example, wrote a book of Christian evidences. He thought there was use to evidences. There's a use to arguments. There's a necessity to arguments. And so that's all a historian has to say. This person writes, I am cautious in what I need to understand about the dreams being reported amongst Muslim peoples, dreams of Jesus, true slash false slash concerning slash joyful. What am I to make of these reports? Well, I think the whole issue is extra biblical special revelation. Is there in this day extra biblical special revelation? And I say no. And I think that everything that God has to say of special revelation is contained in the 66 books of the Scripture, and that with the book of Revelation, the canon of Scripture was completed and was closed, and everything that we need to know uh, is contained in the Scripture and that dreams and visions for today, I think, are, are nothing like, um, let's say, the dreams and visions in the Old Testament and during the New Testament times. So, I, I'm one that believes that the apostles and the prophets laid the foundation for the church, Ephesians 2:20. And the special revelation that has come to the church has come through the apostles and the prophets. And the foundation is only laid one time, and that's at the beginning of the building project. And that was laid in the first century. Uh, the foundation is not put on the roof in the last century before Christ comes. And the foundation is not supplemented uh, at various times in the progression of the church age. So that is why we preach the Word. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of Christ. That's why we send missionaries. That's why we send preachers. Um, so th that would be my firm answer on that. And if that is not the answer, then we've opened Pandora's box to every extreme um, I mean, I can't even make sense of what few dreams I have. I mean, it's, it's, it, they're, they're all just obtuse and, and, and weird, really. Um, and I, I, I put no stock in present day dreams and visions, and I think that the case is made in the New Testament for that, um, and I do not think there is a case made for it being extended to today. So that's why we're going to have to send missionaries. That's why they're going to have to suffer and be persecuted in Muslim countries. That's why we need to print Bibles and have Bibles distributed in Muslim countries. And it's going to have to be a real person going in there with a real Bible and preaching the Word and witnessing and praying and being willing to suffer for the consequences of advancing the gospel. Sometimes I've seen Cornelius in the book of Acts used as an example for this, but I think if you follow through that whole account, it actually contradicts that idea because it's Peter 
going to him as a person and explicitly teaching him about the gospel. And so we find the examples from Scripture specifically pointing to a preacher and the explicit preaching of the gospel. And I think this is an area we have to pay very close attention to. Uh, When we talk about pluralism in our day, but as an evangelical church or as a Reformed church, we're really susceptible to inclusivism. And what we find is this idea of we have this, again, continuum. You've got pluralism, many ways to uh, many gods. We have exclusivism, one way, one God. But there's this middle-of-the-road inclusivism that says, well, what if there are many ways to the one God? And what if there are multiple ways beyond the explicit preaching of the gospel in Jesus Christ? And you see many self-professing evangelicals promoting various views within this inclusivism space on that continuum. And dreams is one of them. And it's an area that we need to pay close attention to and stress that there is one way of salvation, the explicit preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ, one way to the one true God. Uh, I certainly agree with what's uh, been said, and I think it's a a critical biblical and theological comment on it. But as a historian, I think we can also say that when people claim to have had certain experiences and experienced certain phenomena, we don't have to just say it didn't happen at all. But we can also ask, what? How do we understand this? It, a, a parallel would uh, be uh, people who speak in tongues. Um, I've known people who speak in tongues. I've heard them speak in tongues. That's the phenomenon. How do we interpret that theologically? Uh, Is that the same speaking in tongues that's described in Acts uh, 2? And my belief is it's not the same. So where does this phenomenon come from? Well, I think often people experience what their teachers teach them to expect to experience. And so if you're taught that to be a Christian you have to speak in tongues, you'll be able to speak in tongues. Uh, But that's not a gift of the Holy Spirit. It's a natural phenomenon. And I haven't read a lot about the dreams in the Muslim world. I've heard some missionaries talk about it. But I suspect it's sort of the same. I I suspect you'd be able to trace that the people who have had the dreams have heard about other people who had dreams, and lo and behold, they're having the same dreams. So that very often we have the kind of religious experience we're, we're expected to experience. If you go to a very emotional church, you may well have a very emotional conversion. Uh, If you uh, go to a Dutch Reformed church, they'll drive the emotions out of you. And uh, (laughs) sorry, that's just to my Dutch friends. Many times as we witness to unbelievers, we tell them God loves you. Psalm 5.5 states of God, you hate all evildoers. Does God love everyone or just the elect? It reminds me of that excellent answer I heard from Steve Lawson. (laughs) Well, God has a general love for all people which is expressed in common grace. He sends the rain to fall on the just and the unjust. He, He causes the sun to shine on the righteous and the unrighteous. He allows unbelievers to enjoy marriage, to have children. Um, There are expressions of God's general love that shine upon the non-elect. They are allowed to go to doctor and to have the benefit of medicine. They are allowed to enjoy music. They can enjoy sports. That's all an expression of the general love love of God. But the Bible does say, Jacob I loved and Esau I hated. And so there's a distinction that is made as it relates to God's saving love. And in Ephesians 1, 4, and 5, He chose us in Christ, in Him, before the foundation of the world, that we would be, ho- we would be holy and blameless before Him. In love, He predestined us under the adoption of sons according to the kind intention of His will. 
And so there is a saving love that God has that is restricted to His elect, those who were chosen before time began. And that's what the word foreknowledge means. In Romans 8, 29, when it says, those whom He foreknew, He predestined to become conformed to the image of His Son, and those whom He predestined, He called, justified, glorified, etc. The word foreknowledge does not mean foresight. That text does not say that God is foreseeing events. He is foreknowing individuals. And gnosko in the Greek, yada in the Hebrew means to enter into a loving, saving relationship with. In Genesis 4 verse 1, Adam knew his wife, and she conceived and gave birth to a son. Uh, It's the most intimate relationship that is a love relationship that is represented in the biblical word know. Uh, Jesus said, depart from me, you who work iniquity, I never knew you, Matthew 7, 23. And Jesus said, I know my own, and my own know me. That's synonymous with, I love my own, and my own love me. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them. In the previous verse, he says to the Pharisees, you do not believe because you're not one of my sheep. So there is a special saving love that is poured out of God for His elect. So there is a distinction in the love of God. There, there, there is a general common grace love that God would extend to all people in that it's His goodness, but it's not a saving love. His saving love is within the sphere of those whom He chose before time began. He set His heart upon them in a distinguishing way. So, I mean, there's many more verses to be cited, but just to give a quicker answer to a very profound question that deserves a profound answer, uh, nevertheless, Jacob I loved and Esau I hate it. And yes, Psalm 5, verse 5, it's also in Psalm 7, it's also in Psalm 9, and it's also in Psalm 11, that God hates not just the sin, but He hates the sinner who commits sin that is outside of Christ. So, um, it, it says even in Psalm 7 that God as the divine warrior takes the bow of His justice and the arrows of His wrath, and puts them into the bow, and they're aimed right now at the sinner, and it says that God has indignation with the wicked every day. It's not just at the end of the age. It's not just in hell and eternity future. It's this very moment. Yet God graciously, with love, extends the offer of the gospel to those who are under His wrath. And even the elect were under His wrath. Ephesians 2 verse 3 says, we were children of wrath, even as the rest. And so, God has extended His saving love to those who were under His wrath. So, we we do have to make that distinction. And Psalm 5 is still in the Bible, and you can't pull a hyper-dispensational card out and say, well, that was just the Old Testament. No, it's in the New Testament as well. And Romans 1 verse 18 says that, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness and ungodliness of men. That's a real wrath uh, that is abiding upon everyone who is outside of Christ experientially. So, that's, that, that's an important distinction that must be made, and I think the whole of Scripture would bear that up. Just, just want to, just want to add something uh, very quickly, just to what you're saying. I, I think this idea is a bit of a miscalculation that we are better served in proclaiming the gospel from the platform of affirming God's love. I think that's a miscalculation. Uh, one of my favorite uh, books of R.C.'s is the little book Saved, and and the whole question of what are we saved from is where he starts, and then what are we saved by and what are we saved for? 
But we start with what are we saved from, and it's exactly what you articulated. We are saved from the wrath of God. And this was the preaching of Edwards. This is sinners in the hands. The bow of God's wrath is bent, the spider dangling over the pit of hell. But we have this sense in the 21st century that we can only present the gospel from a platform of affirming God's love of this individual in front of us. I think that's a bit of a miscalculation as to how we can present the gospel. Sure. And I said yesterday in the seminar that the Holy Spirit has come into the world to convict men of sin and righteousness and judgment. And those who are outside of Christ are under the judgment of God and are headed to the judgment of God. And you have to be… to be saved means to be rescued from ruin. It means to be delivered from destruction. You're, you're not saved from loneliness. Uh, you're not saved from insecurity. Uh, you're not saved from a bad job or a meaningless life. You are actually saved from God, and there's only one who can save from God, and that is God Himself. And so, we are saved from God, by God, for God, is the truth of Scripture. I remember vividly in college seeing a, a Christian friend witnessing to a non-Christian and saying to the non-Christian, God loves you. And the non-Christian says, great, then I'm in good shape. And the Christian had no comeback. I mean, if, if you really are going to say unconditionally to people, God loves you, then you're a universalist. And I don't think you have that universal statement anywhere in Scripture. Yeah, Hebrews 2, 3, and 4, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Escape from what? Escape from the wrath of God. And then later in Hebrews 10, 26 to 31, this later warning passage, it's a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God, is, is, is what that says. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. So, that, that needs to be preached from pulpits, and that needs to be expressed, and we speak the truth in love, and there is this gracious, loving offer of the gospel that God extends to His enemies um, to be reconciled to Him through the blood of the cross. You bringing up Hebrews 2 reminds me that that was R.C. Sproul's last sermon text. Wow. Um, and so, you could go out on YouTube or just go on Google and uh, type in R.C. Sproul Last Sermon, and we've published it out there, and it's transcribed, but uh, that, very, that very passage from Hebrews 2. I have a friend who grew up in the church but is homosexual. She is looking for validation of her lifestyle in the church. How can I lead her to the truth? Uh, this is one of the most difficult issues that we uh, probably face uh, as a church. Uh, in 2018, and increasingly within our society, um, more and more of our young folk are just completely confused about sexuality and gender. And so it's more and more likely uh, that we now have uh, those who uh, will confess to same-sex attraction, and, and I think I would want to make a difference between that issue and um, a homosexual lifestyle and a condoning of a homosexual lifestyle. And and therefore, the church has to be um, careful uh, in the language it uses about um, homosexuality, that um, we, we condemn the sin of homosexuality, of, of homosexual behavior, uh, and the, the same-sex attraction is also a sin but it's a sin that has to be resisted. It's a sin, um, and, and the church needs to provide the help uh, that may be necessary to help them live that, if necessary, celibate 
lifestyle if, if that is um, a, a besetting sin. But, but, it is, but it is sin. It, it's not something neutral. It's not just part of my personality. And you take a personality test and, and this is what I am. Um, but as a, as a pastor, I face this more and more and more um, as, as each year goes by. And uh, this last year, perhaps I've seen it more than I've ever done in my entire life. And um, so it's, it's something that the church has to have a, a very, very, very uh, deliberate, loving, gracious, gospel answer to. Those people who had proclaimed Jesus as Lord and Savior but then commit suicide, are they truly saved, or are they like the seed that was choked out by the weeds and trials of life? Well, that would depend on the individual. Um, some people who commit suicide are believers, and there is the eternal security of the believer, and they would go immediately into the presence of God, though the taking of their own life was a sinful act. Um, others who claim to be Christians would be like those who say, Lord, Lord, but do not know Christ, and then take their life and rather than waking up in heaven, they wake up in hell. And so it would depend, did they truly know Jesus Christ in a personal saving way? And if they did, his sheep will never perish, neither shall any man pluck them from my hand. For my Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no man shall pluck them from his hand. So uh, suicide in and of itself is not the unforgivable sin. Unbelief in the gospel is the unforgivable sin. So someone can be, uh, commit suicide. If they're a believer, they would go straight to heaven. If they're not a believer, but simply a false convert um, who um, has, is deceived about their own relationship with the Lord, then they would go straight to hell forever. So it but it's like it's the same with anyone else. Uh, do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Have you been born again from above? But once born, always born. Uh, you can never be unborn once you're born into the kingdom of, of heaven. Um, I did a funeral this year um, of a man I would call a friend. Um, I knew him reasonably well, a member of the church, and, uh, you know, he put a gun in his mouth and pulled the trigger. And, uh, yeah, people's, people's lives can be, can be messed up. They can, make, they can make reckless decisions, find themselves in really bad circumstances, uh, and feel as though there's no way out. Um, unable, unwilling to face the consequences of their actions, but they were believers, and they sinned. And it, it, it wasn't my uh, job at the time to address was, was the, the suicide a sin. The, the, the question that I wanted to address as a pastor was, what am I going to say to his wife and his sons, um, and to be able to give them assurance. Um, he was a believer. He professed faith. There was no question about that. Um, and that suicide, suicide as, a, as an unforgivable sin is a Catholic doctrine. Uh, it is not a Protestant doctrine. And uh, I think it's v very important pastorally at that moment. Now, six months later, a year later, you know, we may go back and address some of this uh, with the family. But I think at the time uh, of a suicide, it is very important, especially in the case of somebody who is a believer. And, and, and made to all, for all that we could see, made a credible profession of faith, um, but, but fell at the end. Um, that that was not the unforgivable sin, 
and uh, I fully expect to see uh, this person uh, in heaven. Um, and there is forgiveness for this too. And the blood of Christ covers all sin. Is it acceptable for women to take leadership roles in the church to preach and to pastor? Now, 1 Timothy 2 is crystal clear. I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man. When you teach the Word of God and preach the Word of God, you have assumed a posture and a position of authority because you are telling someone what they must believe and you are telling someone what to do, and you speak with the authority of Scripture. And I think a woman can teach other women. I think a woman can teach children. But in the church, to assume the pulpit or to serve as an elder, um, that is restricted to men only. And this is the way God set up the church. And it's a reflection of even the headship and submission that's in the Trinity itself. Um, God the Father has assumed the role of headship, and the Son has chosen to submit to the will of the Father and the Spirit to the will of the Father as well. And we see this in the Trinity. So when you come into church, you should see something that is totally counterintuitive to what you see in the world. You, you should think you're in another world, you're in another place. The church should not try to be as much like the world as it can possibly be. The church should try to be as much like heaven as it can possibly be. And things are different in the church. So this has been a discussion in terms of grounding headship and the Trinitarian relationship. And Derek, maybe could you, you know, expand on this discussion as well? Uh, obviously, the biblical text applies here as well. Yeah, but. let me just add this. My fundamental appeal is to the exegetical teaching of 1 Timothy 2, 1 Timothy 3, etc. And I know when we get into this Trinity debate, there are other things that are being brought to the table. But those texts speak so clearly and to the point that you would have to invent a way not to accept what it explicitly says. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah I'm not sure I want to go into the, the whole Trinitarian thing. That might open a Pandora's box. But there, there is clearly in Scripture an analogy between the relationship that exists within the Trinity and the relationship of Christian marriage and, and the role relationship that exists between a husband and a wife. Um, and I think that that much cannot be denied. You know, Sunday morning is my most countercultural moment. And um, I, I preach on Sunday morning to women who are CEOs of multi-million dollar companies who make decisions on a daily and weekly basis uh, in seven-figure sums and more, uh, and yet they cannot be an elder in my congregation. Um, and, and to yield on that point means that I would have to interpret clear statements of Paul as culturally conditioned statements belonging exclusively to the first century. And if I, if I do that, I might as well give up. Um, I, I, I cannot say any more, I believe, in the inerrancy of Scripture. It, it is a meaningless statement if I do that. And, and therefore, I, I have to stand where Scripture stands. Now, I, I do think that there is some exegetical room for a difference of opinion about whether women can be deacons, whether they can serve in that capacity, and whether, whether the diaconate is an authoritative role. Uh, and and I, think, I think the issue of Phoebe in, 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 uh, in Romans 16 is, is, is open to debate for sure. But, um, but on, the, on the role of the eldership or, or, or preaching, 
I think the Bible is very clear, and the question is a very countercultural question in 2018, and I think it's a question of whether or not we are willing to stand with Scripture or with the culture. And, and let me say that I certainly agree, uh, but again, from the historical point of view, um, the way we now conservatives read the New Testament is the way the church through almost its whole history has read those documents. So to come along and say uh, all of a sudden uh, the church for 1900 years read the New Testament incorrectly and now we suddenly read it correctly, uh, just on the surface of it that seems profoundly unlikely. Possible, I suppose, but profoundly unlikely. And the consequence for the church uh, is serious because when you look sociologically at the church in America, um, it tends to be an institution that draws a lot more women than men. And precisely for that reason, some churches have said we don't have enough men to take leadership. Well, the more women establish themselves in the leadership of the church sociologically, the more men are unlikely to come. And you can complain about that, you can say that's right or wrong, but it's, it's proven itself over and over again historically. And so, you know, it's not just the Bible and theology, although those are the critical things, but also experientially. Um, men need to be told to stop being lazy and take responsibility. And um, that's important. Briefly, let's, let's end on this. How does one deal with brothers and sisters who make secondary issues a primary issue? Or the other side of it is, how have you gentlemen gotten past the various issues with others or each other, such that you're majoring on the majors and minoring on the minors? Well, I'm still friends with people who baptize microphones, for example. <laughs> Well, at least I didn't sprinkle it. <laughs> well, I, what I have so appreciated about the fellowship with people at Ligonier is um, we, Steve and I don't have to pretend that the issue of baptism is not important. Um, I think the question of baptism is very important, and I assume Steve does too. Um, but we can respect one another as sincere believers in the Bible. We can agree to continue to study the Bible on this point. I've helped Steve to see there are no Baptists in heaven. They all become <laughs> Presbyterians on the way up. And, um, but, you know, I, I think there is an attitude that says in order to agree, we have to agree that our disagreements are not important at all. And I don't think that's true. Or disagree. But I find when I talk to a Baptist about baptism or talk to a Lutheran about the Lord's Supper, I am so much more stimulated to think profoundly about those things. It's very helpful. And, and then I come away rejoicing that I'm not a Baptist. Let's end there. Thank you, gentlemen. <laughs>